want choices and right. Choices and right. Choices and right. Hi, I'm Sabrina Nixon, and welcome to our program at Adapt of Chicago Productions. Today we have a very special guest, Dr. Patricia Watkins, candidate for 5th uh, District State Senate. Yes. And welcome to our program. Very good to have you here. Happy to be here. Um, before we get started, I would love for you to inform our, our viewers um, about your upbringing and your background and what led you into the political field. Well. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today, Sabrina. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to be a part of this show. I grew up in the Cabrini Green projects, and in Cabrini Green, I saw a lot of. Uh, it was during the '60s, and there was a lot of, whole lot of organizing going around, going on about social justice, civil rights. A lot of people were fighting uh, to get access to opportunities. And in that time, my mom would always, I would always see her go out, you know, and to march and to do different, different things for uh, justice, and she would always come back and tell us that the reason why she goes out is because justice is not coming to us. We have to go and get it. That's one reason I'm proud to be a part of this show today, Adapt Chicago, because what you're saying today is that we want justice, we want fairness, we want opportunities, we want access. And as my mother said, it only comes when you go to get it, because you have to fight for justice. <laughs> so I grew up in Cabrini Green. I went to Jenner Elementary School and then Cooley High. Uh, eventually moved to the south side. I left high school early, went to work in the steel mill, and there I ended up being a steward for the union, um, fighting for justice for everybody else. So <laughs> it fits. And uh, when uh, the steel mills closed down, I went back to school and studied, got an associate's degree and bachelor's, master's, and eventually a doctorate degree and, and a CPA license um, to improve my skills to be able to help people more. So right now I run a corporation. I have 60 employees. Yeah. And what we do is uh, we do social justice work, policy work, and uh, public safety to work to improve public safety in our communities. Oh, that's great. Well, one thing we have in common is that I'm from Cabrini Green also. Oh, okay. But um, my other question was how did you become politically involved? What uh, drove you to become politically involved? I guess it started, I started with my mother. Uh, as I said, well, my, my mom was a civil rights activist. My dad was a cab driver. My dad ended up being in a terrible car accident, couldn't work anymore. So my mom only had a sixth grade education, seven children, and a husband with brain damage. So she went back to school and started, and she got her uh, elementary, school, elementary school certificate, high school certificate, college degree. She landed a good job at Cook County Hospital, and she moved all of us out of Cabrini Green. Because she said, we're not going to die here in Cabrini Green. But one of the things that, that, that struck me about her was that, as I said earlier, about her being willing to fight for justice. She made it clear to us that we had a role in changing our surroundings. So all the work that I've done around social justice, uh, criminal justice reform, public safety, education reform, it has led me to this point in time where I realized that I need to take a, another step in improving the lives of Chicago families. Um, and so that's how I, I decided to, when, when Mayor Daley resigned, uh, that was the last thing I would think about is running for mayor, but <laughs> I, you know, I just felt that it, w it, was it was important for someone to stand up and talk about the challenges that everyday people experience in this city mm -hmm. and really put forth some real solutions. Wow. Um, so I ran for mayor and I ran against seven famous people. Uh, when I started, I wasn't famous, but by the end I was famous. <laughs> 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 so. Um, you know, I ran because I just, I just know that people's voices need to be heard and that, you know, we've been ignored. A lot of community, a lot of our communities are being ignored or have been ignored or, or pushed aside or made to believe that maybe their ideals were not uh, the kind of ideas that, are, that would resonate with uh, Americans across the society, across yes. our country. And they do resonate. People want justice. They want fairness. They want an opportunity to get a job, to take care of their families. They want to live in a safe uh, environment. And I looked at the fact that murder is the leading cause of death here in Chicago for wow. people under 35. We have one of the, we have like the most violent city in the country for kids, for people under 35. Nobody lives wow. like that in New York. They don't have that problem. In Los Angeles, both of them are larger than, than Chicago. They don't have yes. murder as the leading cause of death. You know, we shouldn't have to live like this. So sometimes studying outside and amplifying your voice is not enough. You got to go inside and make change that's from true. within. And that's, that's the reason true. why I'm running. I know we talked briefly in the past um, how we connected 
um, I received a mailing um, which had your name on it and I read your biography and I'm like wow I have to really you know contact this person because we had so much in common <laughs> even though we grew up in different eras and mm -hmm. different things like that but you know nonetheless we came from the same neighborhoods and the same you know even though the neighborhoods were different but Cabrini Green was just the same as a whole right and I was just explaining to one of um, our producers that even though Cabrini Green was just one complex you know neighborhood mm -hmm. it's just some buildings didn't go to this building and right. you know and that was like you know kind of weird but but you know, nonetheless, you know, we would still be able, you know, be able to, you know, relate to, um, you know, the uh, same, you know, topics and everything. So, That's true. Um, the last time we talked, we discussed um, your intent when you um, are elected state senate. Mm -hmm. Think positive. Right. <laughs> are elected state senate. Uh, what are some of your um, goals? I know uh, one of them was not only bringing back jobs to uh, the inner city, but you made a good point before of mentioning um, prison you know, um, ex-offenders, mm -hmm. uh, what goals you have for them. Like a lot that are uh, released from prison, they don't have any type of plan or goal in mind, and that's why most of them wind up going back to um, the prisons mm -hmm. because they don't have any type of educational or, um, you know, uh, work type of goals. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, you know, what are your um, plans? Well, for one thing... Um, for prison reform yeah, or ex-offender reform. Prisoner reform. Mm -hmm. prison, prison reform, justice, criminal justice reform. Yes. For one thing, um, Sabrina, over half of the guys do go back, guys and girls, go back to prison within three years, more than half. That's largely because there are barriers to employment. They can't get certain jobs. Like, they can't get a job flipping burgers at, at McDonald's. They can't get a job stocking shelves at Jules or Dominic's. They can't work at Walgreens. You know, they can't become a barber, can't become a, a beautician, a nail technician, a real estate broker. I mean, so many things, ways they are kept out of society. And if they have a drug offense, they cannot get uh, grants for school, nor can they get student loans. So if you can't get a grant and you can't get a student loan and you can't get a job, okay, and then you, you're also blocked from certain housing once you have a criminal offense. Wow. And you have to look at the fact that 55% of the adult black males have a felony record in Chicago. Mm. So, and that's according to the University of Illinois report, w along with the Chicago Urban League, and the report was called Vicious Circles. Mm -hmm. And they surveyed in Chicago and found out that over half of the men had felony records. So, if you have over half of the fathers, the brothers, the nephews, and the uncles can't get into uh, any of these job opportunities, can't get into housing, can't get in school to get their lives back on track, you know, what does that do? That leaves the rest of us out here as prey. Wow. Because they're releasing about 25,000 come back to Chicago. It's more than that to get released, like 40,000 are released every year mm. from our prisons. But 25,000 comes back to Chicago. Wow. They come to join the hundreds of thousands that roam our streets. Mm. So w to me, it's a violation of the human rights of the people who live in those neighborhoods. And that's including me. I'm uncomfortable in my own neighborhood because when I see guys, a couple of guys walking down the street, African American, I'm thinking, okay, mm -hmm. it's after 10 o'clock, you know, are they up to no good? I don't think like that if I see a couple of white guys walking down the street up in Bucktown. Yeah, it's like stereotypical. Right, and you know why? Because I know that African Americans are locked out of so many opportunities. I know 55% of the adult males have felony records, and I know that they, they're blocked from school, got blocked from housing, and these, all these things are upon them. So when I come past them, it's not just me stereotyping them, it's me basing my thinking on facts. And that's why we have to change it. We have to change the way we're living. We need a state-sanctioned reintegration plan for all ex-offenders. If they're gonna drop off 25,000 ex-offenders into our neighborhood, they need to figure out how to get them back into society. Yeah, that's true. You made a good point. I, well, you were uh, talking about uh, most ex-offenders are not um, given the same opportunities as far as financial aid and mm -hmm. you know federal housing. And the question came to my mind was, why is that? I noticed when you know I fill out a FAFSA application, it says were you ever convicted of a felony or, or Section 8 housing? You know the same questions, and I was wondering how, you know, what would one have to do with the other? I mean, what difference would it make if this person had a felony? What possible harm could be, you know, could be done if an ex-offender did apply? And you go know. back to school. Yeah, or okay. get, you know, housing that's affordable for mm -hmm. them if they were to find, you know, say, for instance, a fast food job. So, again, like you say, those type of things is not available to them. Right. You know, and, what, what can you do? And then they send them home to live with us. Yeah. So, <laughs> <That's you> know, <laughs> they live all around us. You know, so it's, mm -hmm. 
we, quite naturally, we want our sons and fathers and nephews and uncles at, to come back home. But we also understand that we have to fight those of us that have the strength and courage. We have to yes. fight that they get a chance to re-enter society because when they cannot re-enter society, they go back into the system. And you asked me, you said, why is it like that? Well, you know, if you look back at when this country first started, when we first started as a country, African Americans, they were not slaves. They, we came, when blacks first came to America, they came as individual people, families, they had businesses, farms, they had, wow. you know, they were politicians, they mm -hmm. were, had every role, every role in society. Mm -hmm. And then in 1644, they passed one law. And that one law said that from this point on, Afri anybody of African descent that comes to America would automatically be a perpetual slave. Wow. And so, perpetually. So in other words, the ch children, the children's children, the children's yes. children's children. So that one law put this whole country under a, a dark cloud for, wow. for hundreds of years. It's the same way with the one law that they passed to say, if you got a felony, you can't get a right. grant. One law locks out hundreds of thousands wow. of people from being able to get an education. Same thing, one law said you can't get into uh, CHA housing or get a voucher or Section 8 yes. if you have a felony record. That wasn't on the books always. Somebody passed one law. And that's the reason why we need to get good people in, in government uh, that are willing to fight for our communities, fight for ourselves, and not get caught up by special interests. Because wow. we can change our circumstances and the government has a big role in, in making sure that change happens. So the government consists of people, people who we elect. And that's one reason why I'm running for state senate, the oh, 5th district. Wow. Well, well, I've just learned a history lesson today, you know, <laughs> <laughs> outside the norm. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but that, that's really good information because I know that uh, if you're a felon, I know a lot of uh, parents or single parents who have the Section 8 vouchers or their grandparents, they may have the Section 8 vouchers, uh, maybe their grandchildren or someone um, is in gang activity or drug activity activity and that can ruin their chances of keeping Section 8 housing but mm -hmm. I never knew the history behind um, them you know not getting the Section 8 housing that you know if you were a felon that you couldn't you know apply for these services mm -hmm. and um, just to shift gears a little bit we, we talked about um, um, what your intentions are as far as bringing jobs back to the community, uh, getting the help for the ex-offenders. And what I would like to discuss is another overlooked community, mm -hmm. which is the disabled community, mm -hmm. which I am a part of. And I have two autistic children, mm -hmm. so we're all part of the disabled community. And most of our viewers that are watching well, I would love to know um, when you are elected, what are your plans or your goals or your intentions um, toward the disabled community because as you may know, there's a lot of uh, budget cuts, um, right. which means less funding for programs such as uh, respite care, mm -hmm. um, rehab services, assisted living services, uh, nursing home assistance, anything that's gonna um, require you know, the government's um, financial assistance or mm -hmm. financial help. What are your uh, goals or your intentions to um, help the disabled community? Well, one thing I just want to bring up is that I developed housing on the south and west side, supportive housing, okay. and, uh, and, and, and had a, a portion of it is handicapped accessible, it's wheelchair accessible. Um, and I realized that there are many programs out here, because I use tax credits, I use zero interest loans and, and grants to develop the housing, 24 units on the west side, um, and also 12 units on the, on the south side of Chicago. I, th that money is available, and it is available to develop housing, and we do have a certain set aside that we have to be sure is mm, wheelchair accessible. Wow. But that was one law to get that to happen, you know. Mm. <laughs> 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 when I ran for mayor, I met with uh, uh, many people in, in your community, in the, in the um, disabled community. And, one, and the things they talked to me about were housing, accessible housing, access to jobs that they can do and, and they're kept out simply because they're, they're handicapped or disabled. Um, uh, access to be, transportation. Okay. They talked to me about those three things, transportation, being able to just to be able to roll their wheelchair yes. down the street yes. and know that you know they, can, they get to the end of the block, they don't have to turn around and go back. Right. Um, so I am fully committed to helping any community that is being locked out, pushed out. That's where I'm going to Springfield because you know, many times it seems that uh, our legislators think that if we don't have a lot of people with us or if we don't have a lot of money to give, then we don't count. So they pay more attention to special interests. 
the special interest groups that, that feed mm -hmm. money into, the, into their campaigns right. and don't pay attention to us. So I'm committed to several things. One is hearing you, this community. And that's the reason why I sought them out when I ran for mayor because, you know, I, I, I'm not disabled at this time, but I know most people in this country will be disabled one time or another yeah. in their lives. I think I, I saw, did some research and saw that it was like 70% will likely be disabled at one time or another, either if you broke your leg or it was in a car accident or something keep you from being able to function uh, as you did before. You yeah, were, eventually. You, yeah. Right. If you weren't so, born with it, eventually, you know, something's going to come up in life. You know, you just never know. Right. You, you never know. know. And so it's important for us as legislators to pay attention to that. Yes. Because uh, even though it may not be in our face, the one thing that we're thinking about most, we got to realize that um, this community is important. Yes. It's, 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 most of us will be impacted by it in one time or another in our life of being disabled. And that we have a moral responsibility to, and a fiduciary responsibility as well to take care of, be sure that that community has access to jobs and not discri unfairly discriminated against, access to housing, and access to uh, transportation. Now, uh, and other things too, that access to justice. That's yes. another point. Um, one of the things I talked about when I ran for mayor was having it set up so that we have a larger portion of the housing developments that happen in the community to be accessible. Yes. Um, because since we know research shows us that 70% of us will likely be in that position one time or another in our lives, it makes sense to increase the, the percentage that's true. Uh, of uh, housing that's accessible mm -hmm. uh, for people with disabilities. So that's one of the things I'm really committed to. And I work closely with Alderman Bob, Fier Alderman Bob Fioretti, Alderman Walter Burnett. Um, I've been working with Alderman Maldonado and, and uh, Oh, Wagaspack okay. and, <laughs> um, and also Moreno and you know, their concern also is for the streets to be handicapped accessible, always wheelchair accessible um, and I'm committed to that too so we'll be working together to try to do as much as we can. But okay. it, are there other issues that you like to raise that are important that you um, feel are important actually, to have that, to that was a mouthful right there, you mm -hmm. know, that I'm just really, really, you know, just impressed because, you know, we just look at the everyday issues, like you say, crime and education and, you know, not saying that those things are like, you know, not important. They're, they're going to always be at the forefront, you know, just, um, you know, racism, you know, discrimination, right. stuff like that. But like I said, the disabled community, you know, it, it tends to be overlooked, not intentionally, right. but for the most part, you know, if you don't have a, a personal family member or if it's not happening to you right as of yet mm -hmm. that's just something that's on the back burner so that's why I'm glad you know I'm here today you know as a person with a disability well with children with with disabilities and also re to represent this um, program Adaptive Chicago Productions mm -hmm. and we're so glad to have you here you know to you know express your in your intents you know mm -hmm. on um, helping the um, disabled uh, community and in closing um, I would like to know when is election day and also um, are the polling places will they be um, uh, wheelchair accessible mm -hmm. you know if you can just give us some final thoughts on that right well right now voting uh, early voting started in February 27th it goes through the 15th um, yeah February 27th goes through March 15th okay and they are in handicap accessible places like libraries right now and then we have the, the polls actually open. The final day is the 20th. A lot of people say, well, we vote on the 20th. No, that's the <laughs> final day that you can vote. vote. Okay. And it closes at 6 p.m. or you, you have to vote before then. So, But you can vote now. Also, oh, wait. the polling places are open oh, now, but you have to now. just find out. Oh, uh, how does one with a disability find out, you know, the locations? Do they, um, is it online? Yes. Or who can they contact? Their it's local um, DHS, DHS services or mm -hmm. the 311, you know, will they come out? one that's you know, great. That's a great place to uh, go. Uh, the city clerk's um, mm -hmm. um, website is a good great okay. place to go. But 311 or your alderman's office. Yeah. You can always dial 311 and say, connect me to my alderman. Because usually they'll connect you with like the seniors in Office of Disabilities, mm -hmm. and I'm sure they'll have someone to come out and, and you know, transport. Right, we transport know. too. We oh, do transport. Great. Okay, great. Uh, we, in fact, we pick people up. Uh, we have we have buses and vans. Oh, great. And we pick people up, and some people actually make a, a, a night of it. I mean, an evening of it. They go out <laughs> to to you know, a restaurant. They want to stop at a restaurant and mm -hmm. eat and have fun. So right. we've been doing that. Yeah. So it's March 20th. It's the last day to vote. You can vote now. Um, I, I've been telling people to. Remember that the president is running. Barack Obama is okay. running. <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of people don't, don't realize that he's running. He yeah. is. So you have to punch one for Barack Obama, and I tell him push 51 for Patricia. 
All right. Van Pelt Watkins. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. Appreciate you for taking out, you know, the time of your busy schedule to be with us and to explain your concern, you know, among the disabled community. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate it. Thank you so very much. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, everybody. I want choices and rights. Choices and rights. Choices and rights in my life. I don't want your charity. Are you to be paid to care for me? I want choices and rights in my life. And I don't want to be in your care. I want to be put someplace out there. I want choices and rights.